What's going on everybody, Gem Mint here, and today we're gonna review not one, but three new comics that come out, I wanna say today, I'm recording this pretty early, but these all come out on April 3rd. They're new number ones from Ghost Machine, which is like the new imprint over at Image Comics. It's almost like Jeff Johns pulling an Image Comics within Image, because he has put together an amazing crew here. You have Jeff Johns, one of the great writers of our generation. He's got Brad Anderson, Jason Fabok, Gary Frank, Brian Hitch. You've got Rob Lee, Lamont McGee, Francis Manipal. Uh, you got Brad Meltzer, Ivan Reyes. I love how he's got all these artists that have worked with statue companies. Like, I'm a huge fan of that. You got Peter S., Peter J. Tomasi, and Matal Chut. So, Ghost, uh, Ghost Machine. So, Geiger... Issue number one, this is a new ongoing series. If you guys used to catch my new comic book day reviews back in the day, uh, this had a volume in 2021, which I was a huge fan of. I'm a huge fan of Junkyard Joe. All of this takes place within the same universe. And actually, they give us a nice timeline in the back of these issues to kind of let us know where we're at. Geiger takes place 25 years from now. Red Coat first takes place in 1776. And then it goes into uh, 100 years in the future from there. And then Rook Exodus is like 2170 something, which we'll talk about as well. So Geiger number one, you don't have to have read volume one or that Ghost Machine one shot to really enjoy this. Although there is a small nod to it as far as New Vegas and the events that happen during that first volume and a character that Geiger runs into. And there's a small nod to the story in that one shot. So it's 25 years in the future. We're not sure who caused the nuclear war, but it happened. And we're in this dystopian future. And we're following the exploits of the glowing man, Geiger. He had been uh, poisoned by the radiation. He now has like these plutonium rods in his back, which can give him human form. But when he pulls them out, he becomes the glowing man. He becomes Geiger. And he is a badass who will take down enemies that are threatening him he's not so much a vigilante but if people are causing a ruckus in this nice quiet part of town he's going to defend himself and others so in this issue you have this guy in this kind of like arthur camelot armor he was one of the uh henchmen for uh the king of new vegas and he realizes he has nothing in life he's got nothing for him he's lost he wants to become geiger's sidekick he wants to help him track down another glowing man. There's another person out there in this world that's like him, and he wants to tag along with him because he has nothing. First of all, check out the artwork here, man. Love this kind of Geiger jumping scene, fighting these enemies. He's he's radioactive, so like he could touch their faces, and he like leaves these like disfigured corpses on the ground. Great artwork. So this one. Uh, we get a flashback to Geiger's family. So in the first volume, when this nuclear war happened, when the bombs went off, he puts his family into this bunker. He shuts the door. He leaves himself outside. That's how he becomes irradiated, how he becomes the glowing man. But when he opens the bunker, his family was dead. So it's a tragic story of this kind of unreluctant hero who does do the right thing. He finally agrees to let this guy become his sidekick, and they're going to be out on the lookout for this other glowing man, which kind of looks like he may have uh, maybe electric power, so a little bit different than like the radiation, the nuclear powers that Geiger has. Loving the uh, Ghost Machine merch that they got coming out here, like going all out with this stuff. Again, they put together a huge cast of incredibly talented people, and uh, <laughs> I like how they're going all out with the merch. So then you got Red Coat. Now let's talk about these issues because Red Coat and uh, Rook Exodus both have wraparound covers. They're card, almost card stock, hard uh, covers, great page quality, oversized issues. I think they're like 30 to 40 pages each and still all just $3.99. So Red Coat is very much a character-driven, like personality-driven comic uh, with our character Simon Pure. Uh, Geiger is kind of a mixture between character driven because you have, again, this tragic, heroic character and is very situational. And then you have Rook Exodus, which feels more situational. So this feels more character driven. Rook is more situational. Geiger is more in the middle. So this starts off 1775. 
We have the Paul Revere riding through, screaming, the Redcoats are coming. And then we find out that the Redcoats are actually already here. And they continue, you know, they proceed to slay the civilians. This is during the Revolutionary War, of course. The twist here is that our founding fathers had supernatural powers. You have Thomas Jefferson swinging through, unleashing a plague against the Redcoats. And already I'm hooked. I love supernatural elements. You're tying it in with American history. And then you're giving us our main character, who is a Redcoat. But he's a self-proclaimed coward. Uh, he is not a hero. He's not even a Redcoat. He was hiding the entire time. And during his hiding exploits, he runs into a ceremony where these robed hooded figures are uh, some type of cult that are proceeding to uh, do this ceremony with Benjamin Franklin. So he's trying to get supernatural powers, assuming uh, something similar to what happened with Thomas Jefferson. The only problem is our clumsy, not not anti-hero, I kind of consider him more of a non-hero because he's not bad. He's not an anti-hero where he's like some badass guy trying to do the right thing he's like a selfish uh bumbling not an idiot but like he he <laughs> he slips and falls and gets into the way of this ceremony and he gets judged by whatever this force is from behind the veil that touches him on his shoulder deems him not worthy but still somehow he ends up with the gift and curse of immortality so flash forward over 100 years in the future i love uh how jeff describes being immortal like he's immortal he can't die he kind of well he gets killed many times throughout <laughs> this 100 or, or so years he feels every stab he feels every gunshot he feels every wound he's always extremely hungry feeling famished no matter how much he how much he eats he can never be full but he doesn't die he's a mercenary uh, so he has made a lot of enemies over the years He's been responsible for killing someone's father, someone's brother, somebody's favorite cousin. So he's made himself a lot of enemies and we kind of follow this new adventure with Simon Pure and we get flashbacks of his exploits over the last 100 years. And it's kind of like a funny, lighthearted take. It almost reminds me of like Quantum and Woody, if you guys are like Valiant fans. So uh, Simon Pure runs into an old flame at the bar named Betsy and we get... His interaction with her, obviously it's not a good one. We get a quick flashback of his interactions with females over the last few years. Uh, Betsy sells him out and some of the people that were looking for him have shown up to the bar and they proceed to kill him. So Simon wakes up in a coffin. It's not the first time and it's probably not going to be the last, but he's since got pretty good at freeing himself from being buried alive. Uh, so he gets uh, rescued, uh, I guess you could say, by this character who seems like the reincarnation of Albert Einstein. Now, Simon hasn't seen those cold members uh, since that first interaction. And then, boom, here they are again. They're out to get him. But he has kind of a sidekick himself with this new German kid who seems to be Albert Einstein. Yo, I'm with it. I'm hooked on this one. I loved the character... I don't want to say character development here, but I love the personality that was packed into this guy. I, I love that he's been given this gift, which is kind of like a curse, and he is unworthy and undeserving of it. But it's fun, and it's funny, and the art style is great. And we're going to continue with that trend, go into Rook Exodus. Again, wraparound cover here, card stock, $3.99. The character design is dope, and it, when you find out what that is, it gets even better. So this is planet F. The humans have colonized this larger version of Earth uh, in 2152. They called it Exodus the following year. They colonized it about five years later. And within 20 years, the Earth engine failed and they had to evacuate. So now we have a dystopian future on planet F, a.k.a. Exodus. It's like humans, man. We really ruin everything. Our main character here, Rook, he went from shooing away scavengers, crows at his farm. He was one of the last farmers on Earth to now he's a scavenger himself and he's in control of the crows. So these uh, helmets that they're wearing, you can see he looks like a crow. They have a neural link that they've created for this planet where these wardens can be uh, 
in sync with the, their correlating species. So he can control the crows. There's a character that controls wild boars. There's a character that controls bears. And speaking of bears and wild boars, all of the predators on the planet have grown insanely huge. They're not sure if it's because it's the size of the planet or is it due to the artificial water on the planet. But you have humongous predators here. Luckily, Rook is able to control the crows to help ward off this bear by, you know, pecking at its eye and swarming around its head. The problem is with the Earth or with Exodus dying, the technology failing, he seems to have less and less control over the animals, just like the other wardens. So this one very much has like an I Am Legend vibe, too. He's out there. He's scavenging for resources. He's in this city, which once... Uh, occupied 800,000 people, now just one, just him. And I like how he's going around searching different homes. It's like he's searching hotels or apartment buildings, which all have like bird names, like the eagle and all that stuff. Uh, but I like how he like searches each unit and then puts a red X over it with spray paint to remind himself that he's already been there. Very like lonesome. He catches a movie in a theater by himself. I don't know, what is that? Gone with the Wind or Sound of Music or one of those classics. So he does meet a dying man out when he's out scavenging who gives him this folder. He asks him not to let it burn. So he finally sits down. And he takes a look at it. It's pictures of the man and his family. We're unsure if it's he's not supposed to let his family burn. The pictures. Is, is his family on Exodus? Are they back on Earth? We don't know yet. Uh, but we do know that Rook has a partner in crime here. He's got a companion, another warden named Swine that's out here. And he's the one that's in control of the boars. But again, he's losing control. These animals are becoming desperate. They're becoming hungry. And the Neuralink is suffering. Check out the design on Swine, though, man, with that boar-like helmet. Awesome, man. Awesome character design. Incredible artwork here. And uh, great storytelling. A little flashback which almost gives me like an interstellar vibe, right? Like he's back on Earth, showing him warding away the crows, creating this scarecrow as a kid, and how 15 years later, his dad seemingly burned down the farm. And um, this is kind of like how we get him to sell the farm and agree to go to, uh, to Exodus. Better World is the company. It's kind of like the Black Rock <laughs> of this world. So showing what led to Rook's decision to leave Earth and go to, uh, to Exodus. Yo, I mean, no pun intended. I loved the world building in this issue, like literally built a whole new world. <laughs> and, uh, and again, us as humans destroyed it. So here we have Rook here and we uh, we see bears attacking those wild boars. Now, what's cool is like we're thinking that these bears are just kind of running wild, but there is also a warden to these bears same kind of character design with the Neuralink helmet. Yo, I really dug this issue. I think this one was my favorite out of all of them. And I love the differences. Like, it's the same writer. But again, you have, like, situational base. You have this character-driven storyline with supernatural elements. And then you have something that's a little bit of a mix of both. And if you remember uh, Junkyard Joe, that one is uh, got a lot of heart. Because you've got this robot that went through, what was it, the Vietnamese the war in Vietnam? Vietnam War? Uh, and it's a robot with a ton of heart. So, yo, super excited on what's going on with Ghost Machine, man. So these three issues, they're out in stores now. Pick them up uh, if they sound interesting to you. Leave me your thoughts and comments down below. And as always, man, thank you for watching. Stay minty fresh. Peace.